Heavenly Father, it's so true. Your word tells us, be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. And that's what our sister did, and that's what we do. Anxiety and prayer don't seem to go together. Anxiety without prayer is very strong. But when we pray, we put the burden on the Lord. We rest our fears and everything else on what he can do and promises to do. But it is his burden and not ours. And I believe we all have to learn that at different times in our life. So first of all, I want to thank everyone who's watching this on YouTube. Uh, We have people in California I know who have been watching us, and uh, they've been getting blessed. And I want to thank you for your prayers. If you haven't been praying, uh, it's okay. You could always put up a prayer during the day or at night for the body of Christ. Horizon here. And if you're a part of Horizon, I encourage you to take a step of faith and come out on the waters and come out and join us. Uh, The synergy of being together causes a lot more strength for you and for us. So I encourage you to come out. I also want to thank everyone who watches us on YouTube for their donations uh, for the church. That's a part of it as well. And um, I want to thank everyone here who also supports the work of the Lord in different ways. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. So today's message is part three of the abundant life. I shared it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the Lord, again, has some more teaching on the abundant life. Uh, We know what the word of God says. The thief comes to rob, steal, kill, and destroy, and... I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. May have, that means you may not have it too, even though you're saved. And then he said, if you continue in my word, uh, then you are truly my disciples and the truth will set you free. We're talking about independence today. Uh, The young lady was speaking about how she felt free now from carrying the burden, trying to be perfect, uh, to change the situation. Uh, You can't. Uh, You just need to stay in love with the Lord and put it upon him. Mike talked about the freedom of Independence Day and and how whom the sun sets free is free indeed, free from sin. Uh, You may think, well, sin is pleasurable. Yeah, for the moment. But it becomes a habit and a habit becomes a lifestyle and a lifestyle becomes a destiny. And the destiny is either towards the Lord or towards the other guy. But today we want to talk about To continue in my word, he said, if you are truly my disciples, and the truth will set you free. So I want to bring an illustration here. Uh, How and what do we do when we continue in his word? There needs to be an application to that. There needs to be a strategy. What is the strategy of continuing in his word and staying set free? Well, in a nutshell, it is to glorify God. Whatever you do, you do it as unto him to glorify him. You see, because when self is out of the picture, you start experiencing his life. But when self is in the picture and it began in the Garden of Eden, you lose your life. Not that you have life in and of yourself, but you lose the life that Jesus wants to give you, his life, his abundant life. So the strategy that God has for us is many things, but today I want to focus on a few things such as honoring him and glorifying him. That's our purpose. That's my purpose. That's your purpose. When I glorify myself, my selfish ambitions, I lose the joy of the Lord. I lose all that God has for me. Don't take the glory. Don't take the honor. Always give it to the Lord. Now, on a football team, there's a strategy. They have a goal, both offense and defense. The goal is to score points on offense. So what is the playbook? Well, in our life, the playbook is the Bible. In football, the playbook is what the coach gives. Our coach is Jesus. And he's given us the playbook. And 
one of the ways or strategies for an offensive team to win is to be in unity with the play that they're going to do. If one or two are out of unity of the play and they don't block their man or that person, the play will fall apart. Well, no, no, I wanted to do this. No, no, I wanted to. So unity on a football team is of the utmost in order to score points. And so it is in the body of Christ. The unity is one way that the strategy he gives us. Our strategy is to glorify Jesus Christ. That's the goal that we do, to honor him and to advance his kingdom, to get people saved. Isn't that true? Amen? I mean, that's, that's, how, that's your goal. Your goal, my goal, my goal is not to preach every Sunday and just uh, speak the word of God, but I have to have a goal. What is my goal? My goal is to build up the body of Christ with truth, with the word of God, and to teach what the Lord wants us to do through his book, his playbook, the strategy. So it's to advance the kingdom of God. Now, there's also defense, right? And so the team will watch, it, will watch films of the other team that they're going to play. They'll see their strategy of how they're going to come to attack the offense. So they watch the films and they say, now this is what we'll do to prevent this from happening because this is their strong point. They do a lot of blitzing. How many know what blitzing is? It's not something you eat as a blitz, you know, whatever they call those things. But a blitz is when many times... They just bombard the line and the quarterback with every player. And one player is going to get in because they don't have enough players to block that particular person. And he tackles the quarterback. That's called the blitz. So if an offense watches films and they see that that other team strategy is to blitz a lot, they're going to prepare for that. And they're going to be able to pick up the blitz. Or if they're playing a certain type of zone, they're going to capitalize on that zone and say, okay, this is their strength in this particular zone, but this is their weakness. We need to have some players to uh, catch the ball before that zone, not at that zone. So there's strategies that are involved in going against their defense. And so it is with us as Christians. We know what the strategy is. The Bible says we are not ignorant of his strategies, his schemes. That is the Satan, the opponent. We know he's a deceiver. We know he brings a little truth with a lot of lies. People swallow it. We know that he's out to get you individually and he's out to get the church as well. When Jesus was tempted those three times, it tells us that the devil left him for a opportune time. Hmm? The devil has a strategy. If he sees that you're praying, he's going to wait for an opportune time to when you're not praying. Or When there's a lot of the old friends around who are tempting you, (coughs) he'll come with an opportune time to tackle you, to take you down. So we need to be aware of those strategies. That's why the Bible says, be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So we have to be aware of his strategy. He may bring some bad company around you who don't believe in Jesus, don't care about Jesus, are just living for themselves. They don't want to glorify the Lord. They don't have the spirit of God. And I know that there's always going to be a friendship in terms of having a a feeling for them. Hey, this was my old friend. You know, I really care for him. Okay, but you want to bring honor and glory to the Lord and you don't want to become influenced with that. So you need to pick and choose the times and for what reason are you going to meet with that particular person. Can I get an amen? amen? If it's just to please that person, I think you're making a mistake. 
But if it's to meet that person to bring the word of God, Hallelujah. now you're on track because you're looking to glorify the Lord. So you see, this is where you die to self and you find his life, his power. But if you go in the power of your strength and your ambitions and your feelings, that's when you're going to get hurt. Can I get an amen? This is, this is the strategy of the enemy. But we have the films. We see it. Jesus told us. He shared with us. And so now we must follow that strategy. So when Eli in 1 Samuel 2, his two sons were disobedient to the Lord <coughs> with the sacrifices that they were sleeping around with the women. The Lord said to them, those who honor me, I will honor. That's his promise. If you look to honor the Lord in all of your actions, in all of my actions, he will honor you. That's his promise. And on the other hand, he says, and those who despise me, I will despise them or lightly esteem them. So there's a conditional promise too. You know, if you honor the Lord and your mission, your goal is to glorify Jesus and to honor him, he will honor you. Truthfully, he always does. So the scripture of our goal is going to be found in Proverbs uh, chapter 3. We're not going to go there yet because I want to build up into that. But in 1 Corinthians 10.31 it says, Whether then you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever recreation, work, your job, your family, singing even, he that offereth praise glorifies me. You say, oh, so my singing can glorify Jesus, you see? But when you're thinking about you and your mind is drifting, you're, not go you're going to lose the abundant life that God wants to give you. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So you see, sometimes it, it causes you to sacrifice. He that offered praise, or he that sacrificed praise, glorifies me. So I come to church, you come to church, what's the reason? It's to glorify you, Jesus. Amen. Whatever you do, whether it's with the music, whether it's singing, whether it's cleaning up, whether it's outside eating hot dogs, hamburgers, whatever. Lord, I do this to glorify you. So we pray before we eat. Why? Because it honors him. We recognize he's the one that gives us the food. And our objective is to advance his kingdom. People will see your witness. But really, I want to honor him. Now, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. See, we can honor the Lord in many of our things because it's the right thing to do. But our hearts, he wants our hearts. Why does he want our heart? Because that's the abundant life. Can I get an amen? And sometimes it starts in the head, I'm doing the right thing, and it's got to work its way down to the heart. That's okay. But always keep in mind that, Lord, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not feeling your presence. I'm not feeling your joy in this. And the Lord would say, that's okay. Keep doing the right thing. I will honor you because you have honored me. Amen? He will. You just do the right thing, not because your feelings are telling you otherwise, but because the word of God, that's the playbook that we follow. So whatever we do, is this going to bring you glory? Is this going to honor you, Lord? And then Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Jesus always did the things that please his Father. He always did to glorify him. You know, that's the whole purpose. Jesus did what glorified his Father. Jesus at one time when it was, when the father spoke, there was thunder and some heard it as thunder, others heard it as an angel speaking. 
And it was the father speaking because prior to that, Jesus said, Father, I do this to glorify you. And the father said, I am all glorified. You see, Jesus always lived to glorify him. And guess what? The Holy Spirit said, when he comes, he will guide us into all truth and he will glorify me. Jesus is speaking. So the whole idea is to glorify. Jesus came to glorify the Father and do his will, which was to save us. The Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus. And so the teachings that we hear is for his glory. Now, if I have the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit job is to glorify Jesus, then it only makes sense that two become one. My temple should be glorifying Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's your purpose. That's my purpose. Not to glorify me or yourself. In James 4, he talks about two different wisdoms. It was the demonic wisdom because of selfish ambition. There's all kinds of disorder, but the wisdom of, of above is merciful and kind and, and it brings order. So we have to look at our fruit sometimes and say, well, why is this fruit this, this way? Could it be that I have a selfish ambition? Could it be that I'm looking to glorify myself and not the Lord Jesus? More than likely, that's what it is. So Jesus said in John 7:17 7, to 18, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. So Jesus was refuting what they were saying, saying, I'm not here for myself. I'm seeking the glory of the Father. He sent me. But he who's seeking his own glory, there's going to be a lot of ripples in your life. You want the abundant life? I know I do. I have to surrender and give to the Lord and live for the Lord. For whatever his will is, I want to follow him because I will be, I will be experiencing his life. But when I get introverted and I start looking at myself, living for myself, I become miserable and I lose the abundant life. I may not lose my salvation. I don't believe that. But I surely will not have an abundant life of his power and his spirit. So there is a progression here of how to do that. And here's the progression. He said, if anyone is willing, you see, that's your choice. Are you willing to lose your life so that you can find his life? You and I have to make the choice. He'll never force you. He'll never twist your arm. But he'll give you the word. And then it's up to us to to do what we want to do with it. He's a gentleman. He'll bring it up at different times in your mind. But there's never going to be a woo, big moment where, wow, I get it. You make the choice. I'm willing, Lord, to follow your teaching. And now I know it's true as I follow it because you're going to be good to your promises. That's how it works. In Luke 9, 23, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, his self-centeredness, for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So this is God's upside down teaching to the world. The world tells us, be number one, be the greatest, and you'll have the life. Ah, I got the life. I got my own island. I got pina coladas. I got a hammock to swing on. Okay. How long do you think that'll last? Do you want maybe two islands after that? Or I got a, a, a new car. And ooh, you smell that new car smell? Ooh, yeah. But give it a few months and you'll smell the coffee that you spilt. Or you'll smell something else. But it, it, it goes away. 
You see? Be prudent in storing up treasures in heaven, living for the Lord. Nothing wrong having a new car, but don't put our value in this temporal stuff. Put it in heavenly stuff where neither moth or rot uh, uh, or thief can steal and rot. Can I get an amen? amen? Come on, encourage me. Give me the real amen. amen. <laughs> All right, I like it. I like it. So Jesus said in, in this upside down teaching, he says in Matthew 12, 11 to 12, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, 11 to 12, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Because they were arguing among each other. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And he said, you want to be great? Be a servant of everybody. And then he goes on to say, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. That's God's promise. You want to be the greatest? You want to be closest to God? You want to sense that I'm on, I can walk on the water. Then humble yourself and serve each other. Be a servant. Lord, what can I do? Come to church. I come as a servant, Lord. What needs, what, what, what are the needs of a servant? You know, our, our sister gave a, a pretty good example. I asked her. She could have said no, but she was a servant. She said, for the glory of God, I'll do it. So we always have a choice to be number one. Now I'm holding on to my life. Uh Uh-oh, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to tell them about Jesus. I don't want to be embarrassed. I'm holding on to my life. But you feel the prompting of the Spirit, and he's not going to be screaming. He'll give you a choice. You need to hear that still small voice and step out in faith. And then let's see what the Lord does. But first you have to give him those two little fish before he multiplies it. But if you never give it to him, it'll never be multiplied. Can I get an amen? Amen. Right? So, John the Baptist knew this too. They were telling John the Baptist, hey, the one who was baptized, more people are going to him than to you, John. And John the Baptist said, hey, listen, no one can do anything unless God gives it to him from above. He must increase, but I must. He must increase, but I must. This is the word of sanctification. Big word, I know. But this is the word of losing your life. This is the word of not looking to be the greatest, but looking to be the least as a servant and say, Lord, who cares about my reputation? I'm glad that you accept me for who I am. And not my reputation. Amen. How many movie stars you know have a reputation? They're gone now. Or well, let's go even further back to the pharaohs, the Egyptians who built these big pyramids. Who cares? It's turning into dust. So we be a servant. And that causes a dying to self. Can I get an amen? amen. There's pain in that. But Jesus said, I will exalt you. You honor me. You put me first and I will honor you. So the disciples had to learn that lesson. They were just like you and me. You know, they were fishermen, roughnecks. They, one was a tax collector who, you know, knew a lot about money. The other one was a zealot who wanted to overcome the Romans. So he was, he was more violent in that way. But he had to say, Jesus, you're the answer. I'm not going to take down this government with the sword. I'm going to follow you. And when you follow Jesus... As our sister said, the peace of God comes on you. It's no longer your burden. I'm not saying you're not responsible or you should just put your head in the sand and never have any activity towards goodness or what's right and wrong. No, there's a balance there. But it all begins with obedience or disobedience. That's the only two choices we have. Either it's the wide road or the narrow road. It's either obedience or disobedience. Where did it all begin? It began in the garden. The Lord said, don't eat from the tree. You can eat from any other tree. There were two trees in there besides the many other trees. There was the tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. And there was also the tree of life. They could have ate from that tree. 
He didn't say you can't eat from that tree. He said eat from any tree. So there was a choice. You see, God always gives us a choice because love involves a choice. Either we're obedient or we're disobedient. They thought that they knew more than God. And how many times we think, and I think, I know more than God. But he's given me his word. He's given me the truth. The truth will set me free if I'm obedient and continue in his word. And say that goes for all of us. You know, I think, you know, following Jesus is not just following him because it's the right thing to do, though it is. It's also understanding he wants to give you an abundant life. He wants you to enjoy the freedoms that he has for us. He wants us to enjoy his love. I mean, when we come to the Lord, our love is not the agape love. It's not the love of God. It's the love of man. And it's the love of value. But we don't have the love of forgiveness. But because God has forgiven us out of his love, we now learn to forgive others, right? Yeah. Because we have the love of God in us because we've experienced it. But if you've never experienced his love of forgiveness, it's going to be very difficult to forgive others. So there's teachings in the scriptures that says, hey, I I love you. And I want you to have a, a joyful life. I got plans for you, good plans. Plans of of prosperity and I got a a good plan for your mental anguish. I want to remove some of that old stuff that you're thinking is true because it's false. So it began in the garden of obedience or disobedience and it continues for us as well. Now there are two types of knowledge. Did you know that? There is the true knowledge that Jesus talks about and the Bible, and the false knowledge. The false knowledge is self. They ate from the tree. And I want to give you a scripture in Colossians 3, 9 and 10 that explains that. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed to a true knowledge. Not a false knowledge, but to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created you. It's a true knowledge. Your true self, once you've been redeemed, you're no longer that old person. Christ has done a miracle. He Chop that person down. That old man is dead. But we have to reckon him dead and recognize I'm on a path of denying myself and picking up my cross and following Christ to my old practices. We all have different old practices. Am I right? Some have an old practice of maybe drinking or maybe womanizing or maybe lying or maybe stealing a little bit. We all have old practices. But here he's saying... Don't lie to one another. That's an old practice. That's the old use. So we have to not justify it, but just recognize that God is setting us free from that old self. Now here, here's where it really comes home. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 and 24 says the same thing. It says, the spirit of your mind, there's a difference between your mind and the computer of your mind, and the spirit of your mind is the spirit of the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of walking in faith, believing. That's the spirit of your mind. Let the spirit conform your mind. But if you don't allow the Holy Spirit and the word of God to change us, then we're just going to walk in our old mind. Pragmatism. I've always done it this way. I'm sure God understands. But in the spirit of our mind, we want to put down the old practices and allow his image to be conformed to, let us be conformed to his image. So here it is, (coughs) Ephesians 4, 21, 24. If indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, truth, that in reference to your former manner of life, You lay aside the old self, 
which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new self by faith, the spirit of your mind. You act of what Christ's word said. You put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Wow. Doesn't the Bible say, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind? (coughs) And here Ephesians talks about in the spirit of your mind. So the renewing of my mind has to begin with the spirit of my mind, which is faith. Into the true knowledge. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The true knowledge, he said, God gave them over to deceiving spirits because they love not the truth. There's only one truth, Jesus Christ. Pilate said when truth was right next to him, Jesus, Pilate said, what is truth? And here was Jesus, he said, those who are mine hear my voice. So if you hear truth and you want that, you're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're hearing the voice of God. You have a choice, though. I had a choice. I still get a choice every day. What am I going to do? When the speed bumps come in life, I have a choice. What am I going to do? Or when the hurricane comes, what am I going to do? Where do I stop following God? At what point? Some follow God just for a little bit. Some a little bit more. Others a little bit more. I want to keep following until he comes back as a bride ready for her groom. Amen. We want to have that attitude. Not, okay, I accepted Christ. and been following him now for so many years. And I, I, I don't know, Lord. It's just it's too much. Okay, and the devil's there putting his hands together like a fly. Yeah, okay. Ooh, a little bit more and I got him. Got her. Whatever it may be. But in the name of Jesus... I rebuke that. And you have to come up strong. You have to start fighting now and not just go along like a limp leaf on the current. You have to go like a salmon and fight against the current and get back to the original roots where you came from. You came from the Lord. Amen? Amen. So there has to be that that desire to fight, not just to go along with the current of this world. True knowledge is Jesus Christ and his word. Second Peter says, therefore grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and the knowledge. So we have a choice. We have a choice. So Proverbs is my last explanation here. So go with me to Proverbs chapter 3. And I'm just going to go through it with a few thoughts of application. It's so easy to read Proverbs 3 and to understand the easiness of his applications. The first one is in verse 1 and 2, My son, don't forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now, he tells me in 1 John 5, through, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. So what's burdensome then when it's hard is probably my resistance. Amen? That's when it becomes hard and burdensome. Oh, I don't know if I want to go that way. And, but Jesus, his word says they're not burdensome. So I have to look to me and say, Lord, uh, please, I got some resistance here. Help me out because I know this is the best thing for me. Amen? Amen. So he says his commandments are not burdensome. <coughs> for what reason? Listen to this one. For length of days and years... Of life and peace, they will also add to you. So, length of days, if I keep his commandments, and peace. Okay, how's that work? Well, figure it this way if I'm sinning, I can cut my life short. An alcoholic, he can get cirrhosis of the liver and die. Uh, illicit sex, he can get a, a disease and die. Whatever it may be, if I'm living in sin, sin brings death. And it can bring death a lot quicker than you think. Listen, I had two brothers who died quicker than they should have. 
They were caught, trapped into drugs. But by the grace of God, I came out of it. But my brother, both of them, Teen Challenge, years, months, 18 months in the Teen Challenge, they heard the word, they had the word. But it just takes a little yeast. And that's all the devil can work with you. Just a little, well, I can beat this. I could sin just a little bit. And they died. Overdose. Yeah. So that's not just a, a, a one person, but that'll happen to you. You'll go back to your sin that God delivered you from. That's your first sin that we go back to. Whatever sin that was, that's where we go back to. And the Bible tells me in James that sin, when it comes to maturity, brings death. First it's conceived, and then you follow it out, and then it brings death. So his commandments bring length of days and peace. And that's what I want. That's what you want. Amen? Amen. So we have to be aware of keeping his commandments. And they're not burdensome. <coughs> okay. Three and four. This is very important. This is so God. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor, notice, and good repute in the sight of God and man. Kindness and truth. So kindness without truth will give a hungry man a fish. But he won't teach him how to fish for himself. Kindness and truth. So both of them, kindness and truth, will give a man a fish, but then will teach him how to fish for himself. That's truth. But on the other hand, if you just give truth, yeah, I'm going to instruct you how to do this, but you don't give him a fish, the man is starving. Someone comes into the church, well, he needs to get saved. But meanwhile, that person is hungry. So you're giving him truth. But where's the kindness? Can I get an amen? And on the other hand, if you just give the person kindness and you just keep giving them fish, but you don't give them truth, you're appeasing. You're not helping them. You're helping them for the moment, but not for the future. You're enabling. See, I heard a preacher say, if the prodigal son, when he was hungry and eating the pods of of the pigs, if someone came along and said, oh man, look at this, he's suffering so much, Let me give him a place to stay and let him give him three hots and a cot. Let him feed him. He would have never went back home. You see? So sometimes pain is God's method of getting us closer to him. But you just can't stick with the pain and, yeah, it's good that they suffer. No, I want to help. But I need to be sensitive to what the Lord is doing in that person's life. So we need both. You know who did both? Jesus. Kindness, woman caught in adultery. Where are your accusers? Do they not condemn you? No. Well, neither do I condemn you. Truth, go and sin no more. See? The kindness was bringing the forgiveness, not condemning, but the truth was don't do that again because you'll be in back in the same place. Sometimes we just want to give the kindness, but we don't want to give, oh, I don't want to, that's too, you know. Hey, yeah, you, 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 the situation that you're in now, let me help you. But I wanted you to understand of there's consequences if you do that again. So that's how we bring kindness and truth in God's way. So he did both, five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not some of it. And do not lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make it path straight. So my life, your life, is his life. Know you not that you've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself no more. I want to glorify you, Lord, in all my ways, whatever I do. Now here, here is a teaching from James. <coughs> in the book of James, they were saying, well, I think tomorrow I'll go to such and such a place and do some business. And here's what the Spirit of God said to them. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will do such and such 
business in the city and spend a year there and engage in a business and make a profit, yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Poof. But instead, this is what you should say. If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. You need to plan. The Bible tells us man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. But we can get a little bit on the other side of a little overconfident. Oh, yeah, I've always done it this way. And we forget, Lord, my life is just a vapor. Tomorrow I just might get sick and die. That's what happened to me. Not saying that I was planning on tomorrow, but we all know. A little bug can take you out. So I need to stay humble and say, Lord, is this your will? Is this your will? In everything, trust the Lord. Uh, But I I, I know there's growth in that. Am I right? But I I believe I'm hitting, hitting home here. Because if you're like me, we get comfortable on how we want to ask God for direction. And we just do things our own way. Can I get an amen to that? And I think it, it really presses us at times to understand, hey, you're, you're just a, you're a peanut, and you're a vapor, and you don't know a thing. Can I get an amen? I don't know nothing about tomorrow. Only God knows. He's given me a brain. I'm to use it. Yeah, absolutely. But let's not get overconfident, because we can get too much, well, God will take care of it. Yeah, okay. Let me build a bigger barn, you fool. Do you not know that your life is demanded of you today? He said to that person. So we have to understand to acknowledge him with all our heart. And not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him. Seven and eight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Why is that? It'll bring healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? Does it mean an unhealthy fear? Oh, he's going to punish me. He's going to punish me. Ah, God, should I tie my shoelace? I know I'm supposed to ask you for everything. Uh, Should should I go down to the store and buy some food? I I, I know I should ask you for everything. That's not the fear of the Lord. That's being, uh, being a fool. God has given you a brain. Use common sense. But there are issues that come up, though, that we need to ask him for his will. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Here it is, Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth. That's what the fear of the Lord is, to hate evil, the evil way, the perverted mouth. You fear the Lord, you shouldn't feel, I shouldn't feel comfortable when a person is, you know... Talking slop. I shouldn't be laughing at those jokes. I know some of them jokes are funny, you know, and you got to hold it in and say, Lord, don't let me laugh at this because I know it's not right. But at least least you're you're making an effort. But just to get slapped the guy on the back, (laughs) that was good. You got another one? Yeah. Okay. We want to honor the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so there comes a, a, a time where we have to be careful of what we're saying, what we're doing, and understand that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and a perverted mouth. Don't hate the person. No. But, you know, don't enable that person to tell another one by, you know, being involved with that. So now he says this in verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. (coughs) So what does that mean? He's speaking here about tithing. So give the Lord the first of your produce. You say, well, why why should I do that? Because it it honors the Lord. Lord, you're going to provide for me. And besides... Everything I have comes from you. This is not my money. This is not my life. You've blessed me. And now I can give you the first fruits to show that 
This is yours, and I want to honor you for your kingdom, for your work. That's why we do that, not because we're obligated and, ah, God, come on, Lord, you have enough up there. Why do you want my little 10%? No. It's an honor to give to him. It's a blessing. You know what the Bible tells me? Deuteronomy 8.17 Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and my strength of my hand made me this wealth. So it kind of like puts a break on it. Because if we don't, you say, well, this is mine. You know, this is mine, Lord. You know, you got your spiritual thing and that's on Sunday I go, but, you know. So when we, money, hear me out, and this is not, any type of twisting here. Money, I believe, is one of the strongest pieces in the puzzle for our holiness. Because money is power. It's security. And when we put the Lord first, we're saying, Lord, I'm putting it out there. I'm walking on the water. If I sink, I sink. But I want to honor you. And God says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bed. I, I'm not a prosperity preacher. You give $10, God's going to give you a hundredfold. Yeah, all right, sure. My heart is, Lord, whether you do or don't, I want to give to you Amen. the first fruits because you have blessed me. And when we hold on to it, we're missing on the abundant life of seeing him provide, which will give you joy and strength. Can I get an amen? amen. That's, that's the logic behind it. So he says... Give of your first fruits. And our first fruits, I mentioned also, is a sacrifice of praise when you come into church. Listen to this. Psalm 50, 23. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. So when we praise God, <coughs> you're giving a sacrifice. Because sometimes it's not easy to praise God. You come into church sometimes, you had a rough week, you had a rough day. Uh, whatever it may be. But the Lord says, if you give me in faith and honor me, because that's why you came to church in the first place, to honor me, and you lift your hands or you hold your hands down or you fold your arms, whatever it may be, and you just say, Lord, I want to praise you. I want to thank you. Not because I feel it, but I know it will honor you. And you'll see the power he gives you. Amen? Amen. That's how it works. (coughs) Okay, so we close with these two verses. My son... Do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. Why? Because whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. So this is a quote that came before Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 says the same thing. And I'll read verse 10 and 11. (coughs) But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment, it seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. What is the discipline? Dying to self-will. Putting God first. I might have my own agenda, my own things, but... That's painful when the Lord says, no, put me first and watch what I'll do. Humble yourself, be a servant, and I'll exalt you. I don't know, I want to be noticed, I want to be, whatever it may be. So when we die to that, because God is disciplining us, that is, he's cleaning us into his holiness of who he is. Because Jesus said, the servant shall be, uh, the greatest is a servant. And he said, yet, who's washing your feet? I'm the greatest, but I'm washing your feet. Jesus said this. So do you see, to do that, It's painful. Hey, man, I don't want to wash someone's... I want you to wash my feet. You know, I I, I want... And that's the whole issue. It's I, I, I. My job, your job, the plans that God has for us, the playbook, the strategy, is to glorify Him and not myself. It's to honor Him whatever I do is to honor him. That's our goal, to score points, not to get to heaven, but to further his kingdom. 
But when I'm selfish and self-centered, I'm going to bring a lot of discord to my life, to the life of others. And so I need to say what Jesus says, pick up my cross daily and die to self, and I'll find his life in me and his power. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. Amen. Amen.